Hello there. Welcome to another podcast from Bible Based Podcasts with me, Ron Bailey from BibleBased.com. And you've joined us today in study number 10 in our Bible Based Advent calendar, where we are doing a countdown to Christmas and a few days beyond it with brief Bible studies, about 15 minutes or so each one. You ought to be able to find these studies in all kinds of places. Bible-based podcasts, where you will find other studies too. Biblebased.com, our Facebook group, Friends of Bible Base, as a Bible Base blog post, and especially at newliferadio.co.uk with Mike Coles, and so I'm told, on Spotify. Study number 10, Mary's Anticipation of the Saviour. I'm reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 30, four verses. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke, the historian. Where did Luke get all this information? Perhaps from Mary herself in later years when she was cared for by the Apostle John. The record is in remarkable detail we discover that the visitor is an angel whose name is Gabriel. He is often referred to as an archangel, but the Bible doesn't describe him as such. In fact, we've had quite a lot of speculative information to the behavior of angels at the Nativity. Did you know, for example, that there's no record of their singing? There wasn't a choir either. There was an army. Anyway, Gabriel describes himself as the angel who constantly stands in attendance upon God himself, waiting in his presence to fulfill his will. We first meet Gabriel in the book of Daniel, where he brings messages to Daniel from heaven's court. Later, generations of Jewish teachers add a complicated hierarchy of angels and provided names for some of them too. Such extra-biblical information can easily filter into our minds and We need to guard against it. This is what the angel said, Luke chapter 1 and verse 28. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But who is this woman to have been honoured with God's special messenger and addressed with this greeting? Gabriel describes her as endued with grace. Our translators have the phrase highly favoured. She is a receiver of special grace and is God blessed. She makes no answer to this greeting. The phrase highly favoured, incidentally, is entered into our carols, but Mary is not unique in being highly favoured. In Ephesians, Paul describes all adopted sons as accepted in the Beloved, and that word accepted is exactly the same word translated highly favoured in Luke 1 and verse 28. We may presume that she was a devout young woman, but nothing can have prepared her for this visitation. She must have been terrified. It seems Mary had no prior warning of events in the hill country of Judea, where Gabriel had made an earlier visit. The Quakers used to emphasize the truth that God always speaks to our condition. So when Gabriel says, fear not, it's because there's fear there. Keep in mind, too, that Gabriel is almost certainly speaking to a teenager in her mid-teens. If her knowledge of Gabriel came from the book of Daniel, and she may have had some sense that Gabriel had brought a message from God, but she could have had no inkling of what the message might be. Gabriel speaks to allay her fears and gives her his message. 
she will conceive and give birth to a son. She is to call him Jesus, the same message later given to Joseph. There were probably many little boys running around the streets of Nazareth with names like Joshua, Jesus. Joshua is the Hebrew form. Jesus or Jesus is the, Rome, is the Greek form. Joshua, of course, is one of the nation's great heroes, the man who succeeded Moses as the leader of God's people, who brought the people into their inheritance. Moses brought them out. Joshua brought them in. Was this an indication of this Joshua's future, this Jesus' future? Was he to be a military leader? Later, Gabriel visited Joseph in his dreams and told him that the reason for the name was that he would save his people from their sins. So is he to be a freedom fighter? He was to be called Jesus, but he was to bear another title too. Now the revelation comes in full force. He will be called the Son of the Highest. Mary was to be the virgin mother by whom God would enter the human family and her child would reign as David's rightful heir and his reign would be forever. I wonder how many of those old prophecies turned in Mary's mind. The Word of His Grace Next we have a detailed account of a miracle I suspect that Luke, being a medical man, would have had particular interest in this part of the conversation. Mary said to the angel, Luke chapter 1, verse 34, How can this be, seeing I do not know a man? She was betrothed, of course, to Joseph, but they were not married. How can this be? I don't want to subject this pattern to any kind of clinical dissection. But there's a pattern here that is useful, a useful roadmap to our own journey in the realms of how can this be? Luke 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The simple answer to the question, how can this be? God. That's the simple answer. By His Spirit. There is no human explanation that adequately explains the biological impossibility. This is not a miracle of the order that others have experienced in Bible days. In ancient times, Sarah and Rachel were both infertile, and in answer to prayer, God healed the malfunction. He restored a non-working function and the result was the birth of a child. But this is not a Sarah Rachel type of miracle. These miracles were not restorations of a non-working function. These miracles were much more. This miracle would cut across all normal function, and the result would be not a repair, but a creation. It required divine power, dunamis, enabling power. The Holy Spirit would visit her, and divine dunamis would overshadow her. All human frailty and human inability would be bypassed. God himself would accomplish this miracle. Gabriel went on to encourage Mary's faith with the news that her kinswoman, Elizabeth, was pregnant. It was a lesser miracle a miracle of repair, but it was an indication that God was already on the move. And then God added a telling sentence. This is the American Standard Version, which I don't normally use in the New Testament, but this is interesting. For no word from God, this is Luke chapter 1, verse 37, for no word from God shall be void of power. Other versions tend to simply say that with God nothing is possible. Now, that's certainly true, 
but it's not exactly what Gabriel said. Most of the other versions seem not to have noticed that there is a word that has escaped their notice. The Bible Greek word rhema implies an uttered word. What Gabriel declared was an important truth. Potentially, when God speaks, it changes everything because no word from God, no rhema from God, is without power. If we were to translate it literally, it would say something like, because without powerlessness from God is every word. That's just the way that the Greek language expresses things. If we were to express that in the positive form, every word that comes from God has power. Every rhema that comes from God has dunamis. So here we have the messenger of God bringing a word from God expressly to this young woman, and that word from God comes with its own inherent power. That's what dunamis is. Dunamis power is not additional power. It's not bolt-on power. It's inherent power. It's power to be. So shall my word that goes forth out of my mouth, said God, way back in Isaiah 55. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. When you understand that the angel said, every word that comes from God has power, you'll understand Mary's response. Because Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, Rhema. And the angel departed from her. Now, a word of caution, because there is often a tendency for Christians to try to manipulate God and to try to discover a technique whereby they can persuade God to do things that are their will rather than his. So let me just say this. This word from God is not a self-chosen word or a verse we happen to have found in our Bibles. This is the word that comes directly from God. It's a word that carries within it grace, that's to say, enabling power. But it was still necessary for Mary to receive it. Faith, says the Apostles, comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, rhema, of God. Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That isn't a call to Bible believism. Say it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Whatever you want to say. Every promise in the book is mine. No, it isn't. Not unless God delivers it to your doorstep by a particular word of God's Spirit to your heart. I'm not talking about Bible believism. I'm not talking about modern equivalents of promise boxes. This is a word of God to an individual, spoken to the heart, received in the heart. It's a declaration that when God speaks to us and we know that his word has been specifically addressed to us, then that word, being received, brings power with it to accomplish what God has said. The word must come from his mouth to my heart. What is God saying to you? In these days, are you hearing him? Will you believe it? Will you receive it? This is how Paul addressed some believers. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, the word of his enabling power, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith. What an amazing story this is. This teenager, the future spreads before her, looking forward, maybe not too distant in the future, to the betrothal, becoming a marriage, 
and being together with Joseph for the first time, and then this amazing interruption where an angel appears to her with this amazing promise. How can these things be? Well, simply because every word that comes from God has within it its own inherent power to bring to fruition the seed that has been sown, if it be received by faith. I look forward to your company tomorrow. Do come and join us. God bless you.